It's a gathering place. And people how do you other. spot celebrities uh, geographically so that there are some over there for the, that section of the room? There are some over there for that section of the room. Uh, we do, do it depends where many of them like to sit. They don't always well, like to sit at the same spot. We do. I mean, we try to make a judgment as to what the celebrity wants. I mean, there are some celebrities who come to your restaurant because you protect them, because they know that if you walk into your door and they are pursuing peace and quiet and don't want to be bothered, that we'll put them in a corner and then we'll protect them. There are others that like to be seen. And if we're good, we can relate to that when yeah, we're that's not. That's part of the mix. Yeah. But People watching this program from Miami and Cincinnati and Milwaukee and Minneapolis, can they call your restaurant and get a, a good seat, a good table? Uh, they are wanted, desired. I really believe in that, yes. In our of place course. they can, too. Sure. Oh, I judge we don't, re we don't reserve tables. Some <coughs> restaurants do. We never assign a table. Uh, if you make a reservation, you get the table that's available, but I've tried to, to make the restaurant so there's no such thing as a good table or a bad table, but all restaurants are not like that. Uh, there's always a problem when you have a good table because only so many people can get it, Absolutely. and it's a, it's a problem. Yes, well, at 21, uh, the tables that are, quote, considered the best are closest to the kitchen door, which to me is the worst table in the house. Uh, yeah, why do they all want to sit there? <laughs> well, I, I, and then there's the bar. It. <laughs> yes, uh, I, uh, it's it's a simple evolution. Uh, the restaurant was founded at 21 West 52nd Street 50 years ago this month, as a matter of fact, and it consisted of one brownstone building, and we had a large clientele who supported us then, and as the restaurant expanded into a second brownstone building. We had newer clientele, new, uh, more people came to join us, and the older families were continued to keep their tables in, the, in that first building. And as we expanded into the third building, we continued that same tradition. Our newer people were, were added on, and as they become our older customers, they, of course, become part of what we consider to be, and our customers consider to be, the better, our better tables. It, we have better tables upstairs and we have better tables downstairs. Our dining room, where you like to, do, to dine so much, David, is sought after as much as our bar is. And uh, location is as sought after there as in the bar. Uh, 21 has, we, we've been uh, told that we have a Siberia in our restaurant. Well, I, I don't know where that Siberia is, and when people say, please don't sit me in Siberia, I'll say, fine, the refrigerator door is closed now, so we don't have to go in there. <laughs> the Siberia is the Iranian restaurant across the street. <laughs> yes, which is no longer there, yeah, by the way. Yeah. They don't call it uh, uh, Iranian. But they're Indian no. now. Yeah. It, it, it became do, Indian. Right. Yeah. It yes. do happen, so the problem of Siberia. And I try to avoid because I really don't believe in that. is is detrimental yes. to your organization. It's a shame. Of course. And I had it's very bad experience, uh, which actually was an exciting experience. Bad experience when I start to be whatever you call metro D or directing a dining room. I go back to about 15 years ago at the colony when, when I was 26 years old, and Mr. Cavallero Senior told me, "Let me show what you're able to do," because I was keeping telling him why I cannot be the Metro D, you know. I didn't realize, I was just arrived six months from Europe. And he said, because I have a Metro D here, Capitan actually, I called that, they're waiting for 20 years to become Metro D. I said, maybe by now they're a little bit tired, so why don't you let me try? And he did, and the first day that I got to work, I mean, as a Metro D, I look at a book, and there was about seven names, and next to it was Mr. Onassis, Niarchos, the Duke of Winston, um, Sinatra, I will never forget this. Next to it, the only note was, they want their own their table. I want my table. Mr. Ronassi said, I want my table. So I go to Mr. Cavallero and said, well, you know, for the first day, why don't you help me? Which, what it mean? What are the table that they want? He said, that table. There was only one table. Everybody, <laughs> want, want, everybody want. wants that table. So, story of said, you know, story of my life. <laughs> so I said, but what am I going to do? They said, oh, you want to be a Metro D? Oh, you let me so. Figure it out. Let's figure it out. <laughs> and so, so I said, there is a, any time I'm in charge of the restaurant, the dining room, I will never make one table for everybody. No, but so I create 
I create in every corner so, so, is a table that can be you know, so how did you, you can't let that, that story go. You can't <laughs> oh, I already had Sinatra, Duke of Windsor, yes. Onassis, and Niakos exactly. all Niakos, want the same table. The, all the same table. What did you do? <laughs> and, and, and Gary Cooper. No, um, uh, Gary Grant. Gary Grant. Had, Gary, uh, Gary Grant. Five which interesting was with people. Mr., with Mr. Bo uh, Bill Baldwin. I want to remember the first day. So he looked at me. Then somebody Who came first. Who arrived at Sinatra. the first? Sinatra. Sinatra. So go to Where him, did you put him? And I said, he, he knew me already. And I said, Oh, it's your first day. So don't start in the wrong way. You know my table. <laughs> <laughs> they told me a favor. Say, go to the bar. Say, no. If you want your table, you go to the table. So but why? Say, look. Say, well, this is your problem. So, well, since I have a problem with you, help me. And he went to the table. And Sinatra very, went to the yes, table. Went now to the, the table. Duke of Windsor comes. No, the second one was Onassis came Onassis in. Onassis came. And he was very, was very nice. You know, he was a charming man. And he said, you know, you... Uh, you knew him. <laughs> no, no, he said, because you are the same, you know, Italian you know, or you know, whatever. So you give the table to him. You know, this is my table. I said, please, Mr. Onassis. But he was very nice about it. Few of them, they were not really. It was another gentleman. Another Greek gentleman, he was very upset. <laughs> the second one, he couldn't take it off. He was keeping saying, but Mr. Cavallero, what is my table? You know, so but I why, why are customers upset when they can't? I mean, we have this once in a while, when oh, somebody heavens. walks in, and because, as I said, we don't have any special tables, but they think this is a special table. And they say, but why don't we have the special table? And I don't know what they're Sometimes we create about. that. Well, you know, and then you don't realize. Right, you know, we create right, because yeah. you're I like somebody you create create it, so right but away. But you, we you don't create it, and I still find people. And so now I try to try to. Matter of fact, now some people from this nice station they, they, they really like a corner, another corner, and they try to emphasize that this corner is as good as any other. But and Mr. Niaco still comes to your new place here now. Yes, yes, but I that know. day he wasn't very happy yes, about it. I understand. <laughs> but uh, the answer to your question, why do they, is that they have frail egos. Right. They think that sitting in a particular <clears throat> place in a restaurant is the identification of themselves to the other people right. in the room. Right. And that's nonsensical. Of course. The only thing I like is a place where you can talk without the next. I don't like a banquet when your guest over there that you have a business lunch with he can be heard by the people on the banquet next. I like a thing where you two, where two people can face each other. I think we're all being told this for Mr. Suskind. No, no, no. <laughs> but I made the same mistake no, with you right. a couple of weeks ago. You remember? I used to get a banquet. I don't know why. Sure. 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 that means one of two tables. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you know, you a on a banquet, if you're with a woman, your wife, uh, you can't see her face. You can only That's see her right. profile, That's right? And if you're with a business luncheon guest, you can't yeah. talk. Well, I you agree. Have to talk sideways I, I don't like banquets, but a lot of people do, and I think people who like banquets are people who don't want to talk to each other, but right. want to talk out <laughs> and look at what's happening want to see out the in the show. room. Really? And they well, want to I, watch the show. Um, That's okay. Any day, but last night, I bring a couple, very nice, in a table, which I think is comfortable, next to a column, not behind a column, and they sit down, and they look at the menu, and then they call me and say, you know, now we order the dinner and we are very happy because... I said, but, you know, we cannot see anything from here. I said, you know, we are <laughs> you, <understand? laughs> and they say, you know, we don't really have a... It comes by itself, I said, we don't have a show. I said, oh, no, but, you know, I know that you have uh, Mr. So-and-so here tonight, and I would like to be at a table where I can see him. And so happens that Mr. So Mr. So-and-so, which was... Uh, Warren Beatty was there with uh, with a group of people. And they wanted they, to they become five. Like no, this. no, they become five. They were only two. So this couple finally had given them a table which they could look. So they become five. I had to move this group to another table, and they were there. And again, they called me and said, "But we still we cannot see anything." From <laughs> but you're famous <laughs> dancing waiters. No. <laughs> Customers are really crazy. Aren't they? No, they are very I nice. Have. Again, we. I'll come right back to your story. We'll be back in a minute. Go ahead. Uh, you're mentioning ego and uh, situations with customers reminds me of a story that took place at 21 oh, many years ago. And uh, since this individual is still alive, a Texan, I'll leave the name out. But I was young in the business in those days and I had the afternoon watch. And uh, a customer presented a credit card to pay his bill with. And 20 years ago, 21, and many restaurants did not accept credit cards. Today, of course, we all accept them. It's a way of life. We're in a plastic economy. But uh, when this gentleman signed the check, uh, well, first, oh, they, let me go back. When, when he signed the check, and I didn't recognize his name, 
And I went over to him and I said, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, you know, we, we don't have an account for you. And he said, well, just take my credit card. And I said, I'm sorry, we don't accept credit cards. Uh, with that, he stormed out of our restaurant. And this was at about 2.30. At 5.30, I got a call from a mutual friend saying, Sheldon, I don't know what you did to Mr. So-and-so. He said, he was so mad that he was determined that before this day is over, you are going to accept his signature. And he's gone down to the Federal Reserve Board and he's drawn out a $10,000 bill. Now, in order to get a $10,000 bill out of the Federal Reserve 20 years ago, you had to sign all sorts of forms. To let, they wanted to know why you wanted it, where your reserves were, where your banks were, what kind of resources. They wanted to make sure that, uh, that you weren't going to be using it for illegal means. And uh, with this information, I did a little bit of thinking. Man came, we had a reservation for him for dinner that night. There were four, and with him is our mutual friend. I didn't say a word. Uh, they have their dinner. Dinner is <laughs> almost over now. And in the meantime, now we don't do this anymore, but years ago, with our, when someone asked, when someone had change coming to them, we always gave them a silver dollar in their change. Uh, and so we used to keep in a vault upstairs, a bag of a thousand silver dollars, and we just used 50, 60, 100 at a time, 100 a day, and uh, we would, we had a reserve of them. We also in those days kept a reserve of, we ordered from the bank, new one dollar bills, which we don't do anymore. But they came bundled, 4,000 to a bundle. It was a, and tied in wires, so that we would always have brand new one dollar bills to give out. So I called for one of our silver platters and I ba dragged down this bag which had maybe six or seven hundred silver dollars in it and unbeknownst to the customer or to the, anybody in the room I had this this money put behind the cashier stand and when he asked for the check I told the waiter to come to me and let me know that the man had asked for his check. In the meantime I took this platter put the money on it, put the silver platter on it, and told, I called the captain over and I said, this man is going to pay you with a large bill. When he does, I want you to come right to me. He did, the man, and we were all watching now, and he took out of his wallet this one bill, put it down, and he signed up, wait till you see what's going to happen here. <laughs> and with that, before he could even say Jack Robinson, the captain came back to him, lifted the platter, and said, "Your change." <laughs> <laughs> of a ten thousand dollar. Right. It wasn't. Of course, it wasn't ten thousand. Yeah. It was just a sum of money. Well, this man was absolutely flabbergasted. Uh, their, the friendship, of course, was broken between because he recognized that uh, he was betrayed by this mutual friend. <laughs> But we did open an account for him. He's been a good customer ever since. And, and that's uh, how Governor John Connolly got started. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the chef in your life as uh, temperamental uh, a legend as he is thought to be? Uh, the chefs are thought to be explosive personalities, very temperamental. Uh, some chefs are. Some are. Some Not are. the ones Definitely. you have today, of course, because you don't want to lose them. There were reasons for a chef being temperamental. They're working under great tension in the kitchen. They have deadlines to meet on each and every dish that's produced, and each and every one has to come out of the kitchen looking right, being prepared properly. They are working not only themselves, but they have other people who are working under them and for whom they are assuming a total overall responsibility. Right, and they have to care. That's the other yes, thing. And you absolutely. See, so they should be a little temperamental. They've got to be tough. They're like generals in the kitchen. And so I think that's sometimes confused. I mean, they really care if they're great chefs, and therefore they're very tough. And it's also a rather dangerous job, especially in a big restaurant. I mean, you know, the, you have people working with knives, and on many occasions in our restaurants, I've seen people attack the chef with a knife. 
And so he's got to be tough and he's got to be on his guard. He's got to wear a lot of my shirt. All the time you learn how to handle that. I guess experience sort of teaches you how to sort out these sort of dangerous people. You don't succeed every time, no. but you pick out the calm ones because you got to have a little calm, capable people. Yes. Just the same. Now, I, I, temperament up to a point, yes. it is accepted. Beyond that, you can't put up with it. Mean, it's it's, it's, it's the way. ultimate pressure cooker a, in a big kitchen. I have yeah. a French chef which is strong, but it's not temperamental. It's good. Now, my, my actual He's chef. He's charming. He comes out. Very, and he comes out because I really push take... him out. You want to keep an image which once, twice a, a day. I want him to come around. So if there's some problem, I think as a joke, you know, Mr. So-and-so tonight would like to have this thing done in this particular way, and they understand better the problem. I thought he was an actor play. He was so good. Why are you thinking about somebody else yeah. now? <laughs> yes, Vincent. I was going to say, there again, it depends upon the place. Uh, I couldn't have a temperamental chef. My place is better. Yeah. I mean, we serve right. as many as six, 650, 650 meals in roughly 45 minutes. I mean, you come in my restaurant the quarter after six, People are dribbling in. Quarter of seven, it's jammed. Seven thirty, it's empty, and everything's gone in and out yes. and everything. If you have a temperamental man, he, but first of all, he just wouldn't take the job. But, no, but he's got to be. No tough. way he can he's gotta be he able to be. He's got to be tough. And he has to have, more like a general. I mean. He has to have an incredible depth. That's right. Particularly in a big restaurant, he has to do so much more than cook. I mean, he has to administer this staff of twenty or twenty-five cooks under them. He's got to make sure that they're there, that they're trained. He's got to make sure the food is there. The chef at Luchas was a European and. Some would view him as temperamental, but he's really excellent. Has to, on Friday, be thinking about how he's going to put out 5,000 meals. This is in the holiday season, over the weekend. I mean, it's incredible pressure. I know of no pressure similar to it. That's right. What Please. about the uh, unionization of restaurants? Now, your waiters and your busboys are unionized. Everybody. Today. Everybody. Yes. Everybody. Yes. What has that done to the esprit uh, of the restaurant? Uh, it, uh, are it's a little problem, all right. It's a problem. Seniority is okay, but also talent in time. We must find some way that talent should be promoted. Yes. Not only seniority. I really believe that. Must you now promote according to seniority, seniority strictly? More than no, anything we don't. else. We no, don't. I have, never, you know. I have never had that problem. I, I have never found a situation where if we went to the union and said, this is what we want to do, never. Have they said no? No, no the union, they are more, much uh, more reasonable. Now, but much better than they were years ago. Much better. But I think it's just the, the, the whole idea in here that we have a disadvantage of what happened in Europe. In any kitchen in Europe, you have a 10 or 15 and some five minimum young guy willing to go to this restaurant. And they know that they are there because they want to learn. It's not that you exploit them. It's the only way you can do it. Right. It's the only way you can arrive to be a chef and to learn, to, see, to be there, not with the pressure that you have to produce for the, for the money that you are earned, just to be there and learn. I have been doing that for 10 years before I arrived to demand a wage, and I don't feel that anybody... You were an apprentice uh, uh, for 10 years. Yes, but that yes, exists. in any I country. I find now yeah. that a lot of that is existing, especially No, in it's New difficult York. to do. Well, in a large After, restaurant like, uh, like, like we have, we have a lot of apprentices. We have a lot of young kids who go to the Culinary Institute, or even who don't, who come in, and we, we must have at least 15 apprentices in each of our restaurants. Do you have that, uh, gentlemen? Uh, we, we do. We, uh, we have uh, young people in from the Culinary Institute. Sure. We have a young boy who started to work just this week, who lives in Monte Carlo. He's uh, an, a sommelier's apprentice, and we have five sommelier, uh, five active sommelier in our house. Uh, but it's very important for these young men to be that's trained. And be I think trained that's properly. the major change in restaurants in New York Absolutely. and perhaps in America <clears throat> is that now people are proud to work in restaurants in the lower jobs as they were in Europe. That's yes, now but come it's the, it's the only to, way. But that's come to America and that's important and that's Not necessary. That much. For now you have to do young. <clears throat> you have to do before you go to the You're institute. integrating well, women. There are women yeah. bus boys. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. bus yeah. The ground rules. The, the ground rules cooks, have changed. Cooks, that's great. Waitresses. Well, well, women waitresses. Captains. Women captains. Apropos of what uh, Werner was saying, uh, when I went, in, I went to Columbia, theoretically pre-med, switched the business, <clears throat> when I went to work in the restaurant, my classmates made fun of me. I mean, they thought it was a big joke. And to have a college man, my parents said, you know, here we put you through college and everything, and you end up working with your hands. They didn't think it was a good idea to go in the restaurant. They didn't want me in the restaurant business. Well, now, practically everybody in the restaurant business is a college graduate, has good education, 
the people working for you, most of the people come in for jobs are college graduates. Uh, we have apprentices too, and they're American kids. They're not foreign kids. And they end up they they have to. Them, you know? I think there, there's two significant changes. First of all, the the talent that came from Europe until 15 years ago or 10 years ago is no longer coming in the same numbers. There's no reason they can make as much money, they can do as well, that relates exactly. to the dollar. Mm -hmm. Two, there is a maturity of the, the training process in this country, the Culinary Institute, and I mean that's probably the premier one, but there are really hundreds of others that are springing up. and. These graduates have matured into responsible positions, and people are coming to work for them. I have sort of one anecdote, and this happened. The, very, the, the chef at Luch House was one of the senior professors at the culinary, so that many kids came to work for him at Luch House as externs. And the very first night, I think I was taking my wife for a tour. We just bought the place. We were opening next day. And it was 1 in the morning, and I went down to the bakery shop, and there were two kids working at 1 in the morning. And I said, well, what, are you, what are you doing here? I mean, the place was, there was nobody there. And one of them said to me, Chef Van Earp said that if I finished this lot and was really good, that I could stay and work in this bakery and work under him for a few months. Well, I don't think you found that so yeah. often un until No, no, reason. but uh, there should be more, more than that, because the only way that you can keep uh, having restaurant of quality, just to have people willing to stay and spend few years, not six months, six months it doesn't mean, few years in several restaurants and learn, and, and just learn not to expect really much. I, I went to France, to Germany, to Switzerland, again it took me exactly ten years before I could go back and say well, of course in Europe you had to speak three languages before you could even apply for a job in a, in a, in a restaurant of a certain caliber. And today uh, they still do over there and I'm glad that it's starting to be here too. But you know, it has to be done by somebody young and that you want to do, not because uh, he doesn't find any other better job and say, let's me go to a restaurant now. Mm. Pride, Remember, if you think you're just going to walk into one of these restaurants and get a job <laughs> as chef of a maitre d' or even busboy, you've got another thing coming. We'll be right back. How badly has inflation hit your restaurants? 